I'm guessing a few of you out there might have heard of this place right here. Yep, it's Hanafaru Bay in the Maldives, home of the all-you-can-eat plankton buffet for manta rays and whale sharks. But I imagine you've probably never heard about one of its closest island neighbours, Domfanu. Well, today I've flown out to the Bar Atoll, home of the infamous Hanafaru Bay, a UNESCO World Biosphere Reserve known for its huge aggregations of manta rays and the occasional whale shark. But I'm here during a period of conflict between local residents, the Maldivian government and tourism operators, which in recent days has come to a bit of a head. So in today's video, I'm gonna cross my fingers and hope we see one of those massive manta ray feeding aggregations. And a little bit later on, we'll hear from some locals as to what this environmental conflict means for their home islands. And importantly, what it means for the whale sharks and manta rays that so heavily rely on Hanafaru Bay. Welcome back to another Shark Bites episode, everyone. After a solid 24 hours of traveling, I was absolutely knackered and well overdue an early night. But the following day, we woke up to conditions that were favoring a mass feeding event. A moderate westerly wind is exactly what we need to bring the plankton into the bay. That and there being loads of plankton there in the first place. For that plankton to be there, we've come during the southwest monsoon season, which brings a bit of choppy water and, of course, monsoon rains. Fortunately, they don't tend to last too long, but without these vital environmental conditions, the sharks and rays just won't turn up. Right, guys, I have literally just had the call that our manta rays in Hanafaru Bay. Apparently there are 30 or more maybe. So I've grabbed my fins and my snorkel as quickly as I could and we're heading to the boat now. Honestly, I've wanted to do this since I was about 14 years old. So I am absolutely buzzing. There could be 30, there could be more. We'll see what happens, but you've got to be really fast with this kind of stuff. You know, these manta rays can come and go really quickly. So you've got to be ready to go and in the water as soon as possible. So I'm uh, power walking now to the boat. We're going to jump on, head to Hanafaru, which is about 10 minutes on the boat and jump in the water with these awesome animals. I absolutely should have checked the map before heading off. I'm so lost. I've literally got probably five minutes to get to this boat, so I'm now I'm now running. Hopefully we get there in time, but so uh, we'll see what happens. Fingers crossed, guys. So we made it guys just in time, we're on the boat now, heading out to Hanafari Bay, fingers crossed we get those mantas in there. I'm hoping they're going to be there today, really really got our fingers crossed. These are wild animals, we don't know what they're going to do, whether they're going to disappear out the bay any second, so we've just got to keep our fingers crossed and hope we see some. After a few minutes, we'd arrived at the bay and due to strict regulations, boats aren't actually allowed in the bay itself. But after a quick safety briefing and a reminder of the code of conduct, it was time to gear up and jump in the water. Straight away, you can just see how thick this water is with plankton. It's like a soup of tiny, tiny creatures. Phytoplankton and zooplankton are some of the most important organisms on planet Earth, forming the base of most marine food webs, and they're a vital food source for planktivorous sharks and rays. Without these weird little dudes, the entire ocean ecosystem would basically collapse. Unfortunately for these individual planktons, though, the winds, currents, and tides have sucked them into Hanafari Bay, which is perhaps the worst place on Earth to be if you're a plankton. Pretty quickly, we spotted our first manta ray. This one here is a reef manta, mobula. Alfredi hanging out in the deep, probably getting cleaned on top of that cleaning station. But slowly, more and more mantas emerge from the depths, somersault feeding in tight circles, their white underbelly shining through that murky water, kind of making them look like little ghosts. As they gradually got closer and closer towards the surface, you quickly begin to realize these guys aren't little at all, ranging in size from two meters across to nearly five meters wingtip to wingtip. They're basically like underwater spaceships. And slowly but surely, more and more join the all-you-can-eat buffet until they begin to loop back on themselves, forming a manta cyclone.
And just when I thought it couldn't get any better, this guy showed up. <laughs> what an experience that was, epic. I've honestly dreamt of doing that since I was about 14 years old. I think I read about the manta rays of Hanafari Bay in BBC Wildlife magazine or something like that when I was 14. So I've waited 16 years to see that and it was everything that I could have dreamt it to be. There were so many manta rays. I don't know how many there were. 70, 80, 100. I have absolutely no idea. Everywhere you looked, there was manta rays of all different shapes and sizes. Some of them pretty little, maybe two meters, but some of them probably had a disc span of five meters. There was big big individuals there all doing the feeding behaviors that we know they do in Hanafaru Bay like somersault feeding, chain feeding, piggyback feeding and then to see a cyclone is just you couldn't write it and then the whale shark at the end oh my god the whale shark just steaming in to try and get its fair share of plankton oh a privilege that was an absolute privilege when I say privilege as well I mean privilege when you come to these places and you get to see and experience something like that in person it is a true privilege because like I said to you guys at the start of the video I have come here during a bit of a period of turmoil surrounding Hanafari Bay. So there's a few groups of people right now that are in a bit of a heated argument. You've got the Maldivian government, environmentalists, the ecotourism operators, and then you've got the locals of an island called Donfanu, which sits right next to Hanafari Bay. And the entire argument centers around a process known as land reclamation. Can you spot the difference between these two pictures here? This is Mali, the capital of the Maldives, once upon a time in 2013, and these days in 2025. Yep, you spotted it. They filled in that area of ocean there with land. Because the Maldives has the lowest lying land in the world, averaging elevations of just five feet above sea level, it means the country is extremely vulnerable to sea level rise. And so to combat this, as well as their growing population, for many years the Maldivian government has been undertaking a process called land reclamation. Essentially, they dredge up a load of sand and coral debris from the seabed and plonk it adjacent to the existing island, creating a beach where there used to only be water. And that new land then provides space for housing, schools, hospitals, all the things you might need in a community. But as you can imagine, the entire process is pretty environmentally destructive, especially to ecosystems that are already very fragile. And that's exactly what was proposed on Hanafaru's neighboring island on Fanu, specifically 13 hectares of land on the southeast side of the island here. The potential problem though is that this is agonizingly close to the western side of Hanafaru Bay, the very entrance point by which westerly winds and currents move the plankton into the mouth of the bay, which then feeds the mantas and whale sharks. As it stands, the Maldivian president Mohamed Muizu had originally signed the agreement, but after pressure from environmental groups made a dramatic U-turn and cancelled the project for now. So that's land reclamation, a very real and very present climate change issue here in the Maldives. It's also a really divisive topic that has lots of people from different sides of the argument all discussing it and finding it really hard to come to some kind of solution on the issue. But I think I'm probably going to have to talk to someone who knows a little bit more about it than I do. And I think I'll probably have to talk to someone from Donfanu. Thankfully, I managed to find a local resident of Donfanu who was willing to talk to me, so I headed off to meet them. Although, because this particular topic is such a divisive and controversial one, the local that I spoke to didn't want to risk their job by discussing political issues, so wished to remain anonymous. As such, I've blurred the next clip and slightly altered their voice. Donfanu is my home island. I'm nearly 32 years of old now. Donfanu Island is yeah. where I was born. The main reason they went for a protest is because there were so many not trusted news mm -hmm. was spreading all over the Maldives. Because Recently, our president came to Dongfang and then he promised and even he signed the agreement of land reclamation of Dongfang. And then a couple of weeks later, the government said it was the people of Dongfang who don't want to do the reclamation. So that's why they got angry and upset. I am like more than 30 years. So the question is, did I get any benefit or did any of Dongfang people, they got benefit from Manta or Welsa? The answer is no. So we have to sacrifice our homes and everything for Manta. Mm -hmm. I would like to save Enver. 
government don't from have applied for government offices many times for a authorization of it but there is no response now the fees directly will go to government so that might be a reason they don't want to give the area to tomfan mm -hmm. and also we have a group of people who's called rangers they are the people from edafur which is too far away from tomfan so tomfan is next to hanifur bay so at least government can implement group of dumpan people to protect that area which is more close that's the main reason people of dumpan they ask in government at least give for people who are close to hanifaru mm -hmm. to take care of the environment yeah. so we are asking government to give those areas to dumpan council mm -hmm. so we will be taking care of the whole area mm -hmm. at least please provide us a uh, alternative for further generations mm -hmm. thank you so much for talking to me yes. it's thank been you. really really helpful welcome now i'm not a journalist nor an environmental journalist. I'm a scientist who specializes in sharks and rays and I'm not here trying to bring you some cutting edge journalistic drama because that's not what Shark Bites is about. But what I'm trying to show you is that there's always two sides to every story. And I think we can see pretty clearly in this situation there are definitely two sides. And when we as tourists come to beautiful places like this in far flung corners of the world, we have to remember that there's almost always a local population there. These are what we call local stakeholders who get some kind of indirect or direct benefit from whatever activity is taking place there. In this example, that would be the tourism surrounding Hanafaru Bay. But when local stakeholders feel like they're being ignored, that's when you get conflict. I think hearing from a resident of Dom Farnu there does make you consider the other side of that story. And if you don't listen to those local stakeholders and consider their thoughts or even listen to what they have to say, Hanafaru Bay might actually end up suffering because of it. But you can see it's such a divisive and controversial issue there because the person that I spoke to didn't want their face in the camera or they didn't want to be able to be recognized in any way because they had a bit of a fear of some kind of political pushback against them. At the end of the day here, it's this amazing amazing lagoon and the surrounding waters and all the unbelievable marine megafauna that heavily rely on it that needs our protection. I do hope that the Maldivian government listens to the concerns of those local residents though because I think in situations like this you've always got to consider their thoughts and their feelings and try and reach some kind of compromise whatever that compromise might be. For them it sounds like they want to have some kind of involvement in the bay itself. That local I spoke to there thought why can't the residents of Donfanu be rangers? The rangers come from other parts of the Maldives. Why can't they be from Donfanu? You have them trained up and have them be directly involved as a true local stakeholder in Hanafaru Bay and its protection. What do you guys at home make of all of this then? Where do you sit in this argument? I'm really keen to hear all of your thoughts in the comments below, so make sure you let me know. But before you all dash off, because I know you like to click off right now, if you're interested in learning a little bit more about the Maldives and some of the species that call this part of the world home, you might quite like this video right here. In it, you can join me on a snorkel tour of some of the beautiful beautiful reefs that the Maldives has to offer and I show you some of the weird and wonderful creatures that live there so make sure you give it a click.